We'll do one and four. Everybody come on in. Okay. <laughs> Page 616, 1 and 4. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out this morning. Before we open with prayer, I have a couple of prayer announcements to put on here before we open. And um, let me start with Jen, with uh, Clint uh, Smith. His sister had passed last Sunday, and Karen was a believer. She lived in uh, North Carolina, and Jim and Peggy were up at uh, the villa in Big Fork. And this coming Saturday, I know it's opening deer hunting season, but we will be doing a service for Karen, for Peg and Jimmy, and I mean Peggy and Jim up at Big Fork and Clint and the rest of the family. So this coming Saturday <clears throat> at 2 o'clock. We do have it on the agenda here, but this morning we definitely want to pray for Clint, Jim, Peggy, the rest of the family, and uh, just uh, pray for comfort and peace. You know, we know that Karen's in a better place. She's absent from the body and present with the Lord. And uh, so Clint asked us to pray for him, uh, for the gospel to be spread yesterday in North Carolina. So hopefully uh, the word got out. Uh, the word will definitely get out this coming Saturday. So we want to remember them in prayer. I also have Brett and Kara Carcella. Um, this past week, they had lost their 10-month-old baby. So I don't know if it was SIDS. I think it was SIDS. Uh, but uh, I believe that, again, I don't know all the details, but I can only imagine uh, what it feels like to lose a 10-month-old baby. So we want to pray for Brett and Kara. I know they have friends in the church here. And um, I also have Claire Glines. She has surgery coming up. We want to remember her, remember her in prayer. And uh, is there anything else we should announce before we open with prayer? Yes, for personal? Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's open with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, first of all, we just want to thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. We're just so thankful that you sent your beloved son to the cross, to die on the cross for the sins of mankind, past, present, future. And then be buried, showing the whole world that he died for all of sin. And then three days later, resurrecting, triumphing the grave, triumphing death, life, and ultimately forever having eternal life. And only God could pay the perfect sacrifice for sin. And ultimately, through the resurrection, it is shown that God the Father accepted his son's death payment for sin. 
And that's all, it's, it's all done. The payment for sin is paid in full. And Father, if there's anybody here that's not trusted completely in the finished redemptive work of Christ, Father, we just ask that they do so today, that they would, through the music and through the reading of the word, that they would receive Christ. They would believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, burial, and resurrection. And Father, to your children, you know, just, we're just so thankful that we have eternal life. We know that life here on earth is but a mere vapor. Our time is very limited, but you know, eternal life, to know that we have eternal life freely received by the finished work, all received by faith in what Christ has done for us. And ultimately when a loved one passes, like Karen, knowing that she's absent from the body and present with the Lord. And it's just a, it's just a short time that we're not going to see them. And there's nothing better knowing that your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your grandma or grandpa is saved, knowing that they are, you know, they're not going to heaven because they're good. They're not going to heaven because they're, they're bad or they were baptized or anything. They're going to heaven because of what Christ Jesus has done for them. There's nothing better, nothing better that we can celebrate that. So we know that Karen is in a far better place, as Philippians 1.21 tells us. So Father, we just ask that you'd be with Clint. Uh, Clint loves his sister very much. We just pray that you'd be with him and provide some comfort and peace. And that you'd ultimately fill his mind with beautiful memories of his sister and reminding him that he's going to forever be with her for all eternity. So he just asks that you'd be with them and be with Peggy and Jim. I was up there visiting with them. We just pray that you'd be, give them peace, Father, and comfort. Uh, Mom seems to be doing well, and, but Father, you know, Jim is pretty sad. So Father, we just ask that you'd provide him comfort as only you can at this time. And Father, we just pray you'd be with the couple... Brett and Kara, we know in North Home there, to lose a child, a 10-month-old baby. We know that the grace of God, that all babies go to heaven. And, and ultimately, Father, we just ask that you'd be with them, that you could provide them peace, provide them comfort. And if there's anything that we could do that for them to, to, to be able to get through this tough time, we just pray that you'd open the door, that we could intervene as you want us to intervene there, Father. And Father, we pray for you, Claire Glines. We just pray that the surgery goes well for her. And we pray for Patty and Dennis. And Father, we, just, uh, we know they've had a tough week. We just pray that you'd be, give them some peace and comfort this week. And uh, we're just uh, pillars of the church here and just instrumental and as we move further and further into the gospel. So we just ask uh, that you would give them some peace and comfort this week. And Father, we pray for Jenny Lindine. We know that uh, we're just so thankful that the surgery went well. We pray for continued healing. We pray for Jan Patterson for the continued strength and uh, the her battling cancer. And Father, answer prayer to see many new faces that, that come out this morning. We just truly uh, am blessed to see some people here this morning. And Father, it's just an honor to be here. So Father, we just ask that you bless the body that's represented this morning through the singing and the reading of the word. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to page 87. We'll sing all of them. All three.
say birthdays? Barb? Barb? You must have something to say, don't you, Barb? You must have something to say, don't you? <laughs> Lance said, but you must move on. <laughs> uh, let's sing happy birthday. Anybody else? Carla? Oh, we'll hit Carla again. <laughs> let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Any anniversaries? It's going to be a good day. Okay, what are we on now? How about page 439? All of them. announcements. Sweet hour of prayer. You know, we gather here every Sunday. We talk. And every week, I don't know why I'm amazed, but the answered prayer that we have here every week, the God of the universe, the God that revealed himself in the flesh, dying on the cross for our sins, burial, and resurrection, how we have access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And it's just amazing to sit here and look at the faces. I look at the families and every answered prayer that I see through the families here. Just, it's amazing. It's amazing. And we prayed something up at, uh, I don't know, it gives me goosebumps. You know, I could cry almost right now about the, how we have access to the Father through Christ and how the, you know, the God of the universe hears our prayer, the privilege that we have as his children. But with that said, you know, I'm, uh, I have somebody that wanted to come up and because we prayed for something at the men's advancement and Kevin if you come up here I know you wanted to just give thanks and and uh, a testimony of what the father does the prayers that are answered and uh, I do thank the men that came out for the men's advancement but Kevin just wanted to say something real quick 
Yes, what an awesome God we serve. And when we trust Jesus Christ is in his blood alone, that we're saved and we become a child of his, and he wants us to talk to him so that he can do his will in our lives. I just want to share about uh, the time we had up there at uh, camp, the men's retreat, and uh, the men, they'd all talk about their wives, and you ladies are, are some very fortunate girls, without a doubt. You have tremendous men by your side. And I happen to be the only one there that was still waiting for the right lady. And we prayed, and uh, God has answered my prayer, our prayer. And Proverbs 18.22 says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. I just ask that you will recognize the woman I've chosen, that's chosen me, and from this day forward, her name is going to be Becky Lynn Stocky. And I would uh, pray that you'll all keep us in your prayers, that our lives together will magnify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And with that being said, I'd like Becky to stand and everybody just to say hi. There she is. All right. Service, we're actually going to be doing the wedding today uh, at uh, Kevin's place. And uh, it'll be 3.30 if you want to. More than welcome to come out. Um, another answered prayer is Ronnie Hines. You know, uh, she had a, a test done and checking for cancer, and it came back negative. I mean, just over and over, the answered prayer, and yes. So I just uh, I can't just give thanks enough, you know, to our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, the, the blessings we receive every, every week. So I would ask that all of you take this home, that you continue to pray for people every day on the list here, and um, I don't know, just feel really blessed. Let's see here. I want to talk about the memorial service we already talked about. We've got youth group coming up. I don't know. Is there anything else I should announce? Yes, Patty. Anything? What about it? So if you didn't hear that, this coming Friday, you know, we, you can drop off goods here. And then Saturday, you can drop it off at 7 a.m. It sounds like there's a craft and bake sale. And, you know, and that leads into the grace giving. You know, the grace giving. This is, uh, we don't pass a hat here. We're not looking for a buck. But you know what? If you're saved, you know, if, the, if you're getting fed here, if, you, if other people are getting led to the Lord here, I mean, uh, you know, you should be giving generously. It's what the Bible says. But that's between you and the Lord. And it's... It's not always about the money. Maybe, uh, you know, just maybe you're, you don't have a lot of cash or maybe you could just donate the, the, cook, the baked goods. All of proceeds here go to furtherance the gospel. Karen Smith had passed, and she actually set up all of the money that's re receiving, the families giving to the funeral in North, North Carolina, and I believe where she worked is actually going to match. And all she had set up, all that money goes to the camp. All that for future, you know, sponsorship for kids to hear the gospel of Christ. I mean, that's what it's about. Again, our time here is very short. So you can die with a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. Or you know what? You can take the money and actually support a, you know, a gospel-driven mission, which is this place, this church, the ministries, Dennis, Big Fork, all the people that go out, the youth group, because people are getting saved. The Lord is blessing this place. So I think that's enough said.
let's do last song with uh, last song for the message. Turn to page one oh seven. We'll do all of them. <laughs> Ed, thank you. I had a letter here from Steve and Valerie also. They just wanted to tell us thanks. They had a baby shower, and they just wanted to tell us thanks for letting them use the church. So I'll put the card in the back. I also have an updated phone number list. So we get a lot of new people coming. So if you want to, I'll put this in the back by the coffee for the next couple of weeks. So if you would write your name on there and uh, we can have an updated contact sheet. So uh, now with cell phones, it's not very easy to just look in the phone book to look people up. So, but uh, we could have a master sheet here and uh, so we can know who to contact. Turn your Bibles over to Deuteronomy. If you don't, uh, have a Bible, you can follow along with Ron. Ron does an excellent job.
And I just, uh, again, so thankful for our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ, you know. I would struggle going to a church that would magnify men or glorify men in their deeds, and and uh, I, I wouldn't go. I would just, it would just really bother some, because I know who men are. Men are sinners, and when you read the Word of God, there's nothing better to find confidence in in verses like, you know, Deuteronomy 7, 9. It says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. I mean, he is the faithful God. He's First Kings chapter 8, 56. We read that he keeps all of his promises. You know, we read there in Psalms 51 last week and 69 that, you know, he is the God of mercies. He's the God of grace. So with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you know, we know that you are El Elyon. You are the, you know, the, you're the high God, the most high God. There's nobody like you. You are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And before the foundation of the earth was ever created, and ultimately before you ever created, breathed life into man. We know the plan of salvation was, was already laid out. We know that man is a sinner, and he needs a Savior. And Father, we, just, we know you're the God of grace. You're the God of mercy. And ultimately, you're, you are the faithful God that answers all promises. You keep your word. And that's what we can understand with Daniel chapter 9. And I know Daniel, as he's sitting there studying your word, he's looking back and ultimately just reflecting, you know, the tender mercies of God, the God of grace, the God that is so faithful to his word and always delivers on his promise. And Father, we just know that your word never returns void. So Father, with that said, if there's anybody here that's not received Christ, we just pray today that they would receive Christ. Believe they're a sinner. They could never be good enough or do any ritual or sacrament to earn salvation, but they would trust in what Jesus did for them. And Father, to your children, that we would continue to mature in Christ and ultimately what happens to this world or the tribulation or the rapture, we know that that's not the end. We know that there's life eternal, life eternal. And as a child of God, we got so many things to look forward to. How great is that? Our life's just beginning. So Father, with that said, we just pray that you'd bless this body that's represented here this morning with the reading of the word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, we'll turn over to, back to Daniel. Last week, we talked about the tender mercies of God. And over and over in Daniel, between chapter 9, 1 through 12, we read, man's a sinner. Daniel concluded himself in that. And ultimately, we read that God is the one who is righteous. God is the one who is merciful. God is the one who is gracious. And God is the one who is faithful. We need to continue discussing the tender mercies of God and understand God always delivers on his promise for he is God, the faithful God. And ultimately, I have the verse Deuteronomy 7, 9 up one more time here. And Ron will bring it up. Let me read it again. It says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant mercy with them that love him. And the question is, do you love God? Do you love him? And I think many people today love themselves far more than they love God. There are many that say they love God, but they don't trust in his word. They don't believe in his word. And I say, you know what, if you don't believe in his word, you don't trust in his word, you don't love God. Not the God of the Bible. Maybe it's God the Baal, you know, maybe it's Lucifer, or Satan, whatever he presents himself as, but it is truly not the God of the Bible. If you love God, the Almighty God, El Shaddai, you will believe His Word. And His Word says over in 1 John chapter 3, and this is Jesus' commandment. 1 John 3, 23, and this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of, of His Son, Jesus Christ. Not be baptized, not jazz Jesus in our heart, not become a church member, not make any promises, not walk to the front of the church. It says believe. And that is the gospel of salvation will work anywhere in the world at any time. You could be in an electric chair, you could be falling off a mountain, whatever. At any second, you could trust in Jesus Christ as run through and you're saved. Just like that. That's how the gospel will work anywhere in the world at any time. And this is this commandment that we should believe on the name of the Son of God, just Son, Jesus Christ and love one another as he gave his commandment. 
So Jesus Christ revealed himself in the flesh. Jesus Christ came to this world to save us. He came to this world to die on the cross for sins, resurrect for us. Jesus Christ gave himself for us. And I know this is a verse that we looked at last week, but I want to look at it again. Galatians 1.4. It says, who gave himself, Christ gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. He voluntarily, see the God of grace, the God of tender mercies, the faithful God willingly gave himself, went to the cross. Because you know what? Without Christ going to the cross, we are all hell-doomed sinners. There's only one way. So he voluntarily went to the cross, and this is the grace that we celebrate. Now we look at John 3.16, same thing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Another word, gave. Gave, what a tremendous word. So you got Jesus Christ voluntarily giving himself, and you got the Father voluntarily giving his son. This is God. He didn't have to do this, but you know, he's, he's the God of mercy. He's the God of grace. He's the faithful God, and he loves us. And he knows we're sinners and we could never, ever pay for that sin. That's why Christ voluntarily humbled himself as a man and he went to the cross of Calvary and he died for the sins of mankind. And yet people reject that every single day. They say they love God, but they don't love God because if you love God, you would believe his word. And ultimately look in the mirror and see exactly who you are. A sinner that needs a savior. And I say Jesus Christ and God the Father are gracious givers. They are the faithful God. The faithful God, the, the faithfully gives his son to die so others can live, and the faithful God that faithfully gives his life so others can live. And I have not done the wallet gesture in a while here, and, and maybe if you've not seen this, I ask that you look up, because let this hand here represent you and I, and this wallet here represents our sin. God loves us, and he hates our sin. Isaiah tells us our sin creates us a barrier between us and him. And yet man tries to cover it up all the time. Man will try to cover it up by his good works, you know, be baptized, things like that. But the problem is for the wages of sin is death. Payment for sin is death. And here's a logical question that I always ask religious individuals when they say, well, I was baptized. Well, uh, I, I do good things. Well, then here's the question. If you could earn salvation by doing good deeds or being baptized, then why did Jesus Christ die on the cross for your sins? Why did Jesus Christ die? Because there's no other way. Let this hand here represent Jesus Christ, the lamb that was sent to slaughter. Behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He went to the cross of Calvary, and he says, it is finished. And he died, and he resurrected the third day, showing us the payment for sin is paid in full. And you cannot get to heaven by your own merit. It's simply trusting in what Christ Jesus did for you. And when you believe that, his righteousness is given to you. Your faith is counted for righteousness. The righteousness is received and that is received in Christ. That's what gets us to heaven. And how great is that? And if you reject that, then you go to hell. The Bible's very clear on that. He's a faithful God, and he always delivers on his promise. You reject the free gift in Jesus Christ, then you go to hell and pay for it for all eternity. That is up to you. So the question is, do you love God? And I say, if you love God, then you know what? Trust in what he's done for you. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins, burial, and resurrection. Trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now we go back to Daniel 9. So Daniel's sitting there, and he's, he's under the Medo-Persian Empire. We re-get the time there in the first year of Darius, Daniel 9.1. And he's reflecting back about what God had said, the prophet Jeremiah there, and ultimately how God promised that Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, would ultimately come in and take Jerusalem and Israel under captivity for 70 years. And Daniel, now under the Medo-Persian, is like, wow, God is good. He delivers on his promise. And I think it's important. Sometimes we focus on Daniel 9, 25, 26, and 27, probably too much, and for we miss ultimately some of what God's telling us here. How God always delivers. He's the faithful God. He, he delivers on his word. 
So let me read Daniel 9.12. It says, And he hath confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, against our judges, that judge us by bringing upon us great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done, as hath been done upon Jerusalem. You know what? God promised judgment. God told the nation Israel, the Jews, when they came under captivity, the, almost the, I think the, almost the whole book of Deuteronomy is dedicated to Moses telling the Jews if they were to have false gods, they were going to receive some judgment. And they, all the people said, oh, no, we won't. We won't. But you know what? Jerusalem was destroyed. The Jews were dispersed. They were taken into captivity because ultimately we'll read here they bailed, they bowed down to false gods. So Daniel 9.13, says, as, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. So it was foretold all this judgment would come upon them for the worshiping of false gods. Yet people will read the Bible and they'll say, you know, is that the God of the Old Testament? Man, I don't, want, I don't want that God. Yet they have no understanding. The judgment that came upon them, he forewarned them, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And you know who's the rebellious one? It's we, man. Turn over to Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26.1. And through reading the word, we can find out God is the faithful one. He's the one that's merciful. He's the one that's gracious. And 26.1 says, You shall make you no idols, nor graven image. Neither rear up you up a standing image. Neither shall you set up an image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. For I am the Lord your God. Let's drop down to 32 and 33, 26, 32, and 33. He says, I will bring the land into desolation, and your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished as it. And I, shall, and I will scatter you among the heathen. I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. He told the nation this would happen if they were to bow down to other false gods. But here's... What happens when you worship another god? See, when you worship idols before or beside or below God the Father and God the Son, you've demonstrated that you hate God. Turn over to Exodus chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus. So when you say there's many pathways to heaven, when we have this Eastern mysticism kind of seeking in, you know, coming into the churches and ultimately, you know, where pastors are saying and they're quoting from, you know, uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or things like that or, you know, the Dalai Lama. That is doctrine of the devil. And when you say there's more pathways to heaven, ultimately, you hate God. You don't love him. Because, you know, Exodus 20 tells us that. Read Exodus 20, verse 3 through 5. It says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's not multiple pathways. It is, all, it is one way. Verse 4, Thou shalt not make any thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water be under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. There are not multiple ways to heaven. When you, set up a, when you set up and worship false gods, that's a demonstration that you hate the God of the Bible, God the Father and God the Son. And ultimately, you need to know judgment will come upon you for you've rejected the free gift, the gift of eternal life, freely received in Christ, and you'll go to hell and pay for your sin for all eternity. So I see that what he's saying here ultimately speaks to us too. So remember the God, remember God is the God of mercies. He's the God of forgiveness. He's the God that is the faithful God, and he also foretells of his forgiveness. So turn over to Leviticus 26 again. So he tells the rebellion, he foretells them what they should not do. Ultimately, they do. 
And thank God he's a God of grace. He's a law of mercy. And thank God he went to the cross and died for all of us. And he reminds us that he's not the rebellious one. So Leviticus 21, 41 through 42 says, And that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled. See, they're non-believers. Uncircumcised heart. A believer has a circumcised heart. Uncircumcised hearts be humbled. And may they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I remember and I will remember the land. Interesting that he mentions the covenant of Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham here. So what was the covenant with Abraham? Turn over to Genesis chapter 12. And we know that the Lord has promised the nation Israel a land, and that land, that prophecy hasn't come completely true yet. Yet David only captured about one-tenth or one-fifteenth of the land that was promised. And ultimately they're going to have all that land one day. But there's another promise in here. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Abraham, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, from thy father's house on the land that I will show thee. And I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Before we add to that, let's look at Genesis 22. 15 through 18. Abraham brings Isaac to Mount Moriah, offers him up as a offering. Genesis 22, verse 15, we'll start down to 18. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham out of the heaven the second time. And he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Two times we've heard how all the nations will be blessed. So even though man's a sinner, even though man's a rebel, a wicked one, we're reminded here that he is God, the faithful God, who is always faithful and always delivers on his promise. He promised a seed to Abraham that would bless all nations. What is that seed? Look at Galatians chapter 3. Now, we're just not going to read one verse here. We're going to read a group of verses in Galatians, starting verse 6. And ultimately, God promised to Abraham a multitude, you know, that numbered the sea, the stars, and, the, you know, the sand of the sea. That's believers in Christ. Let me read here in, in Galatians 3, 6. It says, even as Abraham believed God, his faith was counted for righteousness. We know that in Genesis 15, 6. So even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So before you could ever be, get into rituals, we know that Abraham, back in Genesis chapter 12, before the law was ever introduced, Abraham was saved by faith and were saved just like Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee, all, in thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. You want to earn salvation by doing the law? You need to follow them all. But here's the problem. You are born, already broken the law, born a sinner. He says, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Yet we have people every day, what a great verse for people to read, yet no, nope, they don't want to see it. No man is justified 
by the law in the sight of God. It is evident there for the just shall live by faith and the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Prophesied back in Deuteronomy, that verse, that the blessing of Abraham might come unto the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of man, though it be out of man's covenant, yet if it be of a confer, no man disannulleth or addeth thereunto. Now to Abraham and his seed, were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as to one and to thy seed, which is Christ. See these men back in Old Testament, they did not have a circumcised heart. They were non-believers. And all this was done because of sin. And ultimately bring the nation of Israel back under God and believers in Jesus Christ. See, this curse is not done for Israel, for they will go through the tribulation. The curse is not done yet. They will go through the tribulation, and they will come, and will, they will welcome, and they will worship the little horn. And we see that in Daniel, the Antichrist, and at the end of the tribulation, they will receive Jesus Christ, finally as Messiah. He will destroy the times of the Gentiles, and he will bring in his everlasting kingdom. But we are reminded here, this covenant back in Leviticus, this covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, ultimately they all were promised a coming seed, how all the nations would be blessed through the seed, and that is Christ right there biblically telling us how are all the nations blessed? Because he died on the cross for all sins. Nobody should go to hell. He does not want one man to go to hell. Yet we have people going to hell every day because they reject him. Turn back to Daniel 9.14. He says, Therefore hath the Lord washed upon the evil and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is a righteous in all his works, which he doeth, for we obey not his voice. So all this evil was done. All this evil that was brought upon the nation of Israel was the choices they made. God warned them. So we are reminded God is a righteous God. He is God, a faithful God. We're reminded faults. The fault here falls completely at the feet of man. Fault falls completely with the nation Israel here. 15. And now, O Lord our God, that has brought thy people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and has gotten thee renowned, as at this day we have sinned, we have done wickedly. So you know what? God delivered once before. And ultimately, he will deliver the nation again. God delivered the Israelites from under the bondage of Egypt, and God is renowned for delivering them. It wasn't Moses that was renowned. They all know it was God that brought them out under the bondage of Egypt. And you know what? God can deliver the Israelites from under the bondage of Babylon too, and God will be renowned for delivering them again. That's what we're talking about here. Verse 16. It says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and thy people are become a reproach to all that are about us. See, Daniel was praying that the Lord's anger and fury be turned away from the Israelites to the enemies for, of Israel, for they were mocking the God of Israel. See, you know, I can only imagine just ultimately... I can only imagine what they were saying. Where's the God that delivered the Israelites from Egypt? Where's you? I mean, I can only imagine the mocking that these people were receiving. 17. Now therefore, our, O oh, our God, hear the prayer of thy servant, his supplications, and cause thy face to shine upon the sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. See, the 70-year captivity was at the end. We know that we're in the first year of the Medo-Persian Empire. And ultimately, for the Lord's sake, let the temple be rebuilt. And we know in the Old Testament, the temple, the showbread, the prayers, the light, the candlestick, the veil, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, everything that was in the Ark of the Covenant were all pictures of a type of a Christ picturing the redemption story, a picture of his, his character, all of it reveals something about Christ. 
And ultimately we see a prayer here that Daniel's uh, let this temple be rebuilt because you know what? When Babylon went in there, they destroyed the temple, they teared down the walls, and they destroyed the city. So you know what? He's, Daniel saying, says, shine upon the temple again. Let the worship be restored to the Most High God, El Elyon. 18, he says, oh my God, incline thy ear, O here upon the eyes, and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplication before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. Daniel calling upon the grace of God. Daniel calls upon the mercies of God and not for their own merit. Daniel pleading the mercies and the grace of God and not their works. He's not saying, restore the temple, you know, because we're great people. No, he's not saying that. And sometimes our prayers, do we pray sometimes like, you know, do this because, you know, I'm a son of God and I deserve this. No, look at the prayer here. We pray these things because he is a graceful God. He's a mercy of God. And he's the God that always delivers that's why we should be praying some of the things that we pray. See, Daniel pleading the mercies and the grace of God and not their works. Daniel beseeching the tender mercies of God and not their good qualities of men. He says they're before thee for our righteousness, but for thy great mercies. That's why, that's why you should answer these prayers. 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake. Oh my God, for the city and thy people are called by thy name. Daniel's request is not for man's sake or man's righteousness, but, the, but do this for your name's sake. See the power of prayer. See the power in one man's prayer, calling upon the grace, calling upon the tender mercies of God. So you have somebody in your life that's being hateful and mean and ultimately maybe even intimidated. I don't know. We all have somebody. You know what? We need to pray for these people. That's what we need to know. We need to not be vindictive and retaliate. We need to pray for these people. We need to pray for our nation. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our wives and kids all the time. We see the power in prayer here. And you're going to see what happens here, the amazing thing. So you know what I say now? Now therefore, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God. And Daniel knows that. In verse 20, he says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. So Daniel was acknowledging his sin. He was acknowledging the sins of others. And ultimately, when we pray, we should probably be acknowledging our children's sin and the sins of others. Be praying that, you know, the God of mercy, grace, that he would intervene, convict us, and help us get us back on track. Call upon the grace of God. And we go here in 21. It says, yeah, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. See, before Daniel could finish his prayer, an answer came to him. What was Daniel praying for? 16 through 18. He wanted the city to be rebuilt. He wanted the walls to be rebuilt. He wanted the temple to be rebuilt. You got to remember this. This is part of the prayer, 16, 17, 18, and 19. That's what he wanted for his name's sake. So the, for God to be magnified and God to be glorified. And ultimately, he has an answer. God sends Gabriel. So before Daniel finished praying, an answer came to him. He's seen Gabriel before, and this time, remember Gabriel, he, last time he saw Gabriel, he was prostate. And Gabriel actually had to sit him up and say, you know, look at me. And this time he's not afraid. Gabriel touches Daniel for Daniel to know this is real. Gabriel nudged him at a specific time. And you know what? What time was it? The evening oblation. Interesting here. It was at the evening sacrifice time. You know, Christ, let's, before we get there, turn over to Exodus 29. They offered up two sacrifices Morning oblation and the evening oblation. Exodus 29. And it's interesting the times for what. Twenty nine says. Twenty nine thirty nine says then one lamb. 
Then one lamb thou shalt offer in the morning, and the other lamb thou shalt offer in the evening. The morning oblation, the evening oblation. See, the times of the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice are speaking of Christ when he went to the cross, when he gave up the ghost. All the Old Testament is a picture of Christ. Remember Exodus 29, 39, and let's turn over to Mark 15 and see if you can picture, see the morning sacrifice and the evening sacrifice. Mark 15. 24 through 39. When they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Three hours from sunrise, the morning oblation, the morning sacrifice, and the superscription of his accusation that was written over the king of the Jews, and with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads, saying, Ah, thou hadst destroyed, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. We know that's from John chapter 2. He says, I'll destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. And they were thinking oh, of the Herod's temple that took 46 years that was still being built. Ultimately, the temple is his body. Another thing, showing us the temple is his body. That's what it's about. It's a picture of what, you know, what Christ is. And the scripture was filled with 29. And they that passed by railed in and wagging their heads, saying, Ah, that thou destroyest the temple, build it in three days. Say, save thyself and come down from the cross. The thing is, verse 30, if he would have saved himself and come down from the cross, none of us would be saved. He actually was saving us. It's an interesting, save thyself and come down. He actually was saving us going to the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking, your religious leaders at that time mocking, said amongst themselves with the scribes, he saved others himself, he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. So here we have the two malefactors mocking Christ. We know one gets saved in Luke 23. When the sixth hour was come, so now it's noon. So you had the morning oblation. He's nailed to the cross. Now it's noon. When the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. So you get 9 a.m., 3 p.m. And in the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he called Elijah. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on reed and gave himself to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. It was like an entertainment for them. They sat and watched and mocked him. Jesus was their entertainment. As they crucified him, as they drained the blood from this man, beat him, the God-man, as he's dying on the cross for their sins, they are looking at him as entertainment. And don't we see churches today using Christ as entertainment? And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and he gave up the ghosts. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him, saying that he cried so, cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly this man was the son of God. Interesting, Daniel is touched at the evening oblation. Ultimately, we're going to be talking about the temple here being rebuilt and things like that. But clearly, I believe, when Christ gave up the ghost, the evening oblation. Verse 22. And he informed me, so back to Daniel 9. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. So Gabriel come to instruct Daniel on the restoring the Israelites from captivity, rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the city, rebuilding the temple and the coming Messiah. 
23, he says, At the beginning of thy supplication, thy, the commandment came forth, and I come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. So at the beginning of the prayer, prayer the command was set in place. The power of one man's prayer. 24, 70 weeks. We heard about Daniel's 70 weeks. 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. So Daniel's getting answer about this temple, G nation, the G Jerusalem and the city being rebuilt. 70 weeks are determined upon the people, upon the holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make re reconciliation for iniquities, to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most high. See, 70 weeks is the weeks of years. Every week is a representation of seven years. 70 weeks is a total of 40, 490 years. And I think it's interesting that Daniel is reflecting back on when prophecy in Daniel, ultimately how the nation Israel came under captivity for under Babylon for 70 years, and now we have 70 weeks. And I'm still trying to study here and figure out the core. I know there's a correlation there of the 70 weeks and the 70 years, but it's interesting how Daniel is reflecting back. If you look at Jeremiah 25, we actually have him reflecting back, and he says, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, the Nebuchadnezzar, and the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against the inhabitants thereof, and against all these nations round about, and will utterly destroy them, and make them an astonishment, and a hissing, and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom, and the voice of bride, the sound of the miles, millstones, and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation, an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years it shall come to pass and seventy years are accomplished that it will punish the king Babylon that nation saith the Lord for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolation so as Daniel is reflecting back to Daniel, Jeremiah's prophecy here he receives an answer from Gabriel about the seventy years seventy weeks so We're going to end there because uh, we got 24, 25, 26, and 27. But before we end, because there's some good stuff in here, let me read 24. I don't want to read the verse again, but I had more I want to talk about in 24. So as Daniel reflects back on the 70 years, he's under the Medo-Persian Empire. I believe we too will reflect one day. We'll look back after the tribulation as we reign with Christ for 1,000 years. We're going to look back and ultimately see how the 70 weeks of Daniel be fulfilled. The times of the end, Gentiles come to a complete end, just like Daniel reflected back the first year of the Medo-Persian Empire, how the 70 years of captivity were done. And we're going to be reflect back and talk about how the mercy and graceful and the faithfulness of God, how he always delivers on his word. In Daniel's prayer, we witness the guilt of sin over and over from one all the way through, the guilt of sin, the burden of sin, and how it affects people. Daniel prayed for the city to be rebuilt and the temple to be restored, 16 through 19. And he hears something. Daniel hears there's a plan to make an end of sin. Did you read that in 24? To make an end of sins. See, there's a plan to make reconciliation for iniquity. There's a plan to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to set his mark on it. Jesus Christ is the sum of all vision, and he's the sum of all prophecy. To anoint the most holy is Jesus Christ, and that's when he sets up his kingdom. We are also anointed by this most holy, the most holy, for we are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, receive the Spirit of Christ, is an anointing. It is a seal of everlasting righteousness which brings reconciliation, brings sinner man back into favor with God, brings us back into favor with the Father through Jesus Christ, remembering our sins no more. So we see that. 
There's a plan. 450 years before Christ went to the cross, there was a plan to make an end of sin. There was a plan to make recon reconciliation. And there was a plan to bring an everlasting righteousness. But that plan was set in place before the earth was ever created and before man was ever given life. That plan. And ultimately, we look back and we see Christ already fulfilling this. But next week, we'll get into some prophecy. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, again, we're just so thankful that we are fortunate like Daniel through the reading of the word, studying the word that as Daniel was reflecting back and looking at how rotten man is and ultimately seeing the grace of God, the tender mercies of God and how faithful God is and how he always delivers on his promises and ultimately showing that the nation Israel was delivered under the captivity of Babylon. And we too see the same thing. A man is a sinner. Yet we see the faithfulness. Before the earth was created, you had a plan. You were going to give your son. Jesus Christ had a plan. He gave himself for sin. Because he knew this was the only way that God had to die for sins. Only God could make a perfect sacrifice. And that was the plan. And we look back and we see that plan and how great that is that we can sit here today and be like, you know what? I'm a son of a God. I am a daughter of a God. And we know the Greeks and we know the Romans, they, they, were, they all wanted to be sons of gods and, and ultimately daughters of gods and they would come up with these man-made gods and things like that. But you know, we truly can sit here today and say, you know what? I am a son of a God, simply received by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And may, Father, if there's anybody here today that's not received Christ, that they would understand the gospel of salvation. And they're like, maybe they're sitting there and they're like, you know what, that makes sense. That person doesn't need to stand up, get up, come to the front. They just need to sit there right there and they'll be like, you know what, I believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and he resurrected for me. I'm trusting in what Christ did for me. That person right now is born again. That's what born again is. They become a child of God. They receive the position of a child simply by faith. And Father, to your children here, that we can find encouragement, that ultimately we know that we're going we're gonna to disappoint our dad in heaven. And that we can be always constantly reminded as the father of heaven, we might receive chastisement. But you know what? He's forever merciful forever graceful, forever faithful, never ever being able to lose a position as a child. How great is that? That is a, the wonderful words of life. And fathers gather, we just pray that you be with the Smith family. Just a, it's a tragedy to have parents, to have lost a child, to have buried a child. I often reflect back about my sister, my mom and dad, you know, I see them in their 60s. And, but you know, when they lost a child, it would have been in their 20s, early 30s. I would have been like, I'm like, man, I wonder if I would have been as strong as them. I just, uh, to lose a child and for that kid up in North Holmes, his family, to lose a 10-month-old baby and just, but you know what, God, you know what they could handle. And through my sister, we know she saved and there's, Ultimately, we all got saved because of my sister dying, and how great is that? We're going to get to spend eternity with her. So we just ask that you'd provide peace and comfort to these families, and that they would not see the, the, the villain, but they would see the grace and the love and how you intervene in our lives and you do all things for good so people could get saved. That is a good thing. Father, we just ask that you'd be with the families today. Let them have fun on the foundation of Christ and let them celebrate and magnify you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and turn to page 314.